Our uh, Sunday morning series through Matthew, we've called it Behold Your King. Behold Your King. Matthew wrote this gospel presenting Jesus, who was called Christ, who is called Christ, Matthew would say, presenting Him as the Anointed One, the King of the Jews, but not only the King of the Jews, but the King of the whole world, the King of all the universe. So behold your king, and as we've studied the life and the teachings and the ministry of Jesus up to this point, we have had ample opportunity to look at Jesus, and it's changed us, and it is changing us. He is. It's easy to get our eyes on, on, on other things and off of him, and so we are encouraging ourselves in the Lord to behold our king. And so today, with this text, our thought is, behold your crucified king. And what, a, what an interesting idea that is, isn't it? Kind of a paradox. How would a, a king with power and glory serve people and suffer terrible things and be crucified? How does that make any sense? How is a, a crucified man the motivation to do anything? You know, there are many people in the world who would feel like this. How could someone claiming to be a king suffer and die? In Matthew's day, there were plenty of people in the Greek world, in the Roman world, who, who per pop culture, per, per the thinking of the day, they thought it was a really dumb idea to follow some rabbi, some teacher that had been killed. He didn't even have the power, didn't even put up a fight. He was just killed and supposedly rose again, they would think. Okay, we're talking about non-Christian people. Or the, or the Jews at that time, in the first century who did not like what Jesus had to say because he, called, he held up a mirror in front of their eyes and they saw their own hearts, they saw their own sin, and so they rejected him as their king. And, and, and they, couldn't, they couldn't get over the stumbling block of, our Messiah was not supposed to suffer and die like this. That was their mindset in the day. But as we're going to see, he was supposed to. Okay? And so you have this interesting paradox. How could someone claiming to be a king suffer and die like this? Why would, if, if he was the son of God, why would he allow this to happen? And, and that leads me to ask you, what's your verdict on Jesus? Who is he to you? You know, we'll see today, to some men, he was a, he was a fool. He was a point of mockery. He's an idiot, a moron, uh, among morons. Not worth their time, a game to be played. To others, he was someone, they saw him as a criminal. They did not like what he had to say, so they criminalized him, and they called him a blasphemer, and they, they worked and manipulated to put him to death. And I'm asking you, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? Because who you think Jesus is really matters. Well, and, and what's more than that? Was Jesus just an example? Uh, do we read, when we read this and we hear about this today, is this just a man who died a martyr's death and he just died to be a good example to show us how to be true to a cause? So I don't have to be true to the, God's cause. I can just pick a cause and I can follow his example and be true to my cause even if I die for it, even if the cause is not just. Was he just an example so you could be a social revolutionary? Or was he, in fact, as Matthew presented him, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who will one day return as King of kings and Lord of lords. And if that is so, then how you respond to what you hear today is of an eternal importance. And there's no in between. Either Jesus is who he says he is, who the gospels say he is, and thus his death means something very specific and important to your life, either, either, either he is that, and it's of eternal consequence, as a writer would say, or he, he is just a fool, and you're just wasting your time today, and this isn't important at all. But what he cannot be is somewhere in between. You have to pick what you will believe. And so if you've been buying the message of culture, the message of religious elites or political elites in this world that you can redefine Jesus, make him what you want him to be, then I am challenging you today to hear what Matthew has to say about Jesus who is called the Christ and how he suffered and how he died. So we, we get to this 
point, and Pilate was the Roman governor in that area. And of course, the Jewish leaders, they hated Jesus the night before the synagogue, some 70, uh, or Sanhedrin, some 70, 71 men, they had this illegal and unjust trial, and they brought Jesus uh, before them there, and they had all these false witnesses lob these accusations against him, and and first light in the morning after they had spit on him and punched him and blindfolded him and slapped him and said, Come on, prophesy if, if you're the Christ. After they treated him all that, they took him to the actual place to do judgment, the actual courthouse, if you will, and, and gave him the sentence that he was supposed to die. But they did, not have the, they did not have the power to put him to death. Rome reserved the right of capital, I'm, here I go again, capital punishment. By execution, only Rome could execute someone. They didn't have the power to do that. And so they had to come up with some just reason in, in their minds, some reason that was big enough for Rome to say, yeah, we need to put him to death. And so they took him to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who was the governor. And Pontius Pilate was the paramount politician. I couldn't fit any more peas into that sentence, but there he is. He was the paramount politician. Why is that? Because he, he was in a spot in his political career where Rome wasn't happy with him and, if, and wasn't very happy with him, and the Jews in this area weren't happy with him. And if he made one false move, his political career and maybe his life would be over. And so you have the chief priests and elders with all these people, they're coming to him. It's during the feast of the Passover and the chief priests and elders are accusing Jesus of all these things and yet Jesus stood there and did not open his mouth. Did not say a word. It baffled Pilate. He couldn't believe it. Pilate tried to weasel out of it because he had this custom where he, at this a feast every year, he'd try to release a prisoner to the people and give them amnesty and pardon him for some crime. And right at that time, they had this criminal, this high profile, notorious guy by the name of Barabbas, who had led in revolution against Rome. He was kind of on the zealot, kind of a right wing extremist, if you will. And, and he had killed someone and he had robbed and he was in prison and he hated the Romans. And Pilate even offered, he, he pitched. Barabbas versus Jesus before the people and maybe if the people saw how wicked a man this was that he was offering They would see Jesus was innocent because Pilate honestly he felt that Jesus was innocent And yet the people wanted Barabbas to live and they wanted Jesus to be crucified now They hated crucifixion as Jews Crucifixion in the crosses that would line the highways outside of Jerusalem. It was a sign to them, a daily reminder that Rome was in charge. And if you mess with Rome, you're going to get the horns. You're going to get the cross. And they hated crucifixion. And yet they wanted this man who had done so much good for them to be crucified. Their hatred and anger, their, it blinded them to justice. And to what was right. And so, as we began reading, Jesus released Barabbas to them, basically gave Barabbas amnesty, and so he goes off, and Jesus is literally going to take his place. And you notice verse 26 says that when he had scourged Jesus, now I want to make a comment and then explain what this is. You go to John chapter 19, and you will see that the scourging of Jesus that Pilate ordered, he did kind of as a last tempt effort to get the people to back off this thing. Because you read, he had Jesus scourged in John chapter 19, and the way it reads, he, he had him scourged and brought before the people and said, behold the man. It's almost like he's making one last attempt to see, how can this guy be so bad? Why do you want to kill him? And get them to change their mind. And yet when he brought Jesus out after he went through what I'm about to explain. He brought him out and he says, behold the man, look at him. And surely that was a pitiful sight that we're beholding today in our imaginations and our hearts. But he had Jesus scourged. Now, I'm going to have a couple Roman soldiers come help me today. Uh, Rick and Colin, if you'd come at this time. Hold that you to hold that and come on over here and stand on either side of this beam so right now I want you to picture a beam in your mind like this so to scourge someone 
they had something like this fixed in the ground and they would bring the, the victim of scourging to this post and they would strip them of their clothes, more or less. And they would tie their hands around the top of the post so much to the point or in such a way where their feet would either be just barely touching the ground or dangling just above the ground so the back would be stretched tight. And either one Roman soldier or two Roman soldiers, and, and mind you, these were trained killers. These were military men. This is, this is SWAT, if not more. These, and these are the men taken from that group who are willing to do uh, bar, even more barbaric things, willing to do whatever it takes with a criminal. Are you with me? Does this make sense this morning? These are, this is that level of a man. They're willing to cross lines to deal with a criminal. That's who these Roman soldiers would have been like. And the scourging, what would take place, is once they had stripped the man, they had, they had these uh, whips, or they called them a scourge, and, and uh, Richard picked these up when he was doing his death investigation on the death of Jesus a while ago. And he, these were the closest replicas he could find of those. This would be what you would, would be close to, you've heard of the cat of nine tails. Okay, and so what they would have would have these leather straps and they would intertwine sheep bone that was sharp or other things, maybe even pieces of glass into these leather straps and they would have these, these lead or metal balls in them. And so what would happen, either the soldiers would stand on both sides and these are strong men. And they're, they're, they're trained to exact the most pain and the most punishment as possible. They would stand on either side and they would take turns laying into the victim's body. And they would, they would scourge them from the top of their back, even down below their buttocks, on down to their thighs. And they would lay into them. And if it wasn't two, it was, one would do it and he would go on one side and then he'd come and he'd go and he'd do the other side. And back and forth they would go. Now the Jews had a law where it was 40 stripes save one. They, you could not exceed a thir 39 stripes, 39 lashes. But the Romans didn't have a law like that. It was just up to however they felt that day. And so these men began to scourge Jesus and lay into him. And what would happen, those uh, lead balls would strike the skin, it would strike the back and cause deep contusions, some, some deep bruises in the body, so that when the, the leather made contact with the skin, and his skin, I mean, has Jesus been through emotional trauma up to this point? In fact, in the garden, he had sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. There is a condition where you can be under so much pressure that even blood can come out of you with your sweat. He was at such a point where his physical state was so weakened that those contusions, those bruises would have been made. And it, as soon as the la first lacer laceration was made with the bone or the, or the leather, man, he would have been and bleeding like crazy. In fact, a lot of guys who were scourged, they, they never made it to crucifixion. They died there from the amount of blood they lost. They, they, they would be so ripped up, it's almost like someone described it, that it would leave them with quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. You could even see their bones and their internal organs after a scourging. And they did that to Jesus. They did that to him. If you would uh, set those down and get ready to pick that thing up. It's not that heavy. Just, just a sec though. So then he scourged Jesus and verse 26 says he delivered him to be crucified. And so the soldiers then... They took Jesus from there, if you want to go ahead and just step over here just for a minute, and they took Jesus into the common hall. Pilate, or Pilate was at the Fort Antonia, this Roman palace, and this would have been a, a courtyard or a big room, and as I mentioned, there's four to 600 Roman soldiers. And they take Jesus there, and the condition after taking that kind of a beating... That kind of a wounding, and they take him in there, and verse 27 says that they, they made this crown of thorns, and this would have been some, some thorny vine or bramble with large thorns that they would have made a crown. Because, I mean, the Jews are saying, this is the king of the Jews, so here's your crown. 
And since you're a king, you need a royal scepter. And so they took a reed and they put it in his right hand. And they begin to, and you don't have to kneel, but they begin to, to kneel. They begin to bow. And as they would say, Hail Caesar or Ave Caesar, they begin to say, Hail King of the Jews. They weren't worshiping him. They were mocking him. They were mocking this Jewish king, this pretender. Man, what a fake this guy is and how weak he is. Maybe they even thought he was a lunatic because he never talked, he never struggled, he never fought. So maybe they just thought he was a moron. I, I don't know what they thought. They, but they, they bowed and they mocked him, verse 27 says. And, and verse, uh, uh, says, verse 28 and verse 29, they did all these things after having stripped him, put on that scarlet robe. You can imagine if they took his clothes off and, and, and put or had put his clothes back on, and then took him off again and put this robe on him, that that robe would have stuck to the, to the open wounds on his body. And they're bowing and they're mocking him. And then, as if it wasn't bad enough the night before, for some 70 men to spit on Jesus, it says they began to spit on him. And I don't know what this was like, but there's like, there could be four to 600 soldiers in there spitting on Jesus. They began to spit on him and they began to hit him. They took this reed out of his hand and they began to smite him on the head. Now you say, that wouldn't hurt so bad, but this is pretty, it's pretty hard. And you get hit again and again and you've had thorns in your head and, and now you have open cuts on your head and you have open wounds on your body and the, 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 the Greek tense of that word smote is in the imperfect tense suggesting that they were hitting him again and again and again and again and mocking him. Hail the king of the Jews. What a king this is. And so then... From there, they, they took that robe back off. Now, if you can imagine that robe, them ripping that off of his body, if it had stuck to his body, it's going to open him back up. Here comes more blood, and here comes more agony. And so they took that off, and they put his own raiment on, and they led him away to crucify him, just, just a sec. What they would do, the centurion, the Roman, would carry a sign in front of this procession with the criminals. And the sign would say what his charge was, what his accusation was. You know what sign that is. We're going to get there in a minute. The, the charge, the sign they put above his head with the inscription of his accusation. And so the centurion would walk in front of him. They'd walk him through town and they'd walk as far as they could go with the criminal to basically show everybody else, you don't mess with Rome. You don't mess with us. And they, they would lead him outside of the city in the victim. So now if we can imagine this not being a, a, a post so much where someone would be scourged. But the victim would carry their own cross beam. The actual cross would have weighed about 300 pounds. The cross beam that would go across ways would weigh anywhere from 75 to 125 pounds. I think this one actually weighs 300. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, this is not a, I apologize, it's not a time for levity, but this, they, they would carry their own cross beam, likely tie it or put it over their shoulder. So if you men could gently pick that up and bring that this way. And they would begin to carry that cross beam to their place of execution. They'd carry their own cross. Are you good? Strong men. They'd carry their own cross. Now pause and time out. If I can do a, just a, a sentence of a parenthesis. When Jesus told his disciples he was going to suffer and die, and Peter said, no, you're not. You're the Christ. And Jesus rebuked him and said, hey, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and pick up what? They saw this happen all the time. This is what it means to follow Jesus. It's the end of you. Okay? That's what Jesus meant. That's what Christianity means. That's, what salva that's where salvation begins. You own who you are and you die. Are you with me? So, are you good? I, I gotta remember you've got that, okay? So they began to go, but Jesus obviously was not in any physical condition to carry his cross. So they got this man from Cyrene. Go ahead and come this way by the name of Simon. And we're just gonna lay this out a long way right here, if you would. Thank you, man. They got this man named Simon from Cyrene. Cyrene was in uh, an area in the northern port. Um, and y'all can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much. Make sure you shake their hand afterward, okay? He was a man in the north, from the northern part of Africa in Cyrene. And they compelled him to 
carry the cross of Jesus. Now, this wasn't like, hey, could you help us out, buddy? The, the word indicates like they forced him to do this. And the Romans could do this. They could make any civilian. They were, Rome, the Rome was in charge. They could make any civilian do whatever they want. So when it says they compelled him to bear the cross of Jesus, it's like they forced him to do it. He had no choice. And so he took him there and they come to a place called Golgotha. Now, we see you and hear it and sing about it being called Calvary, right? Calvary is the English word that comes from the Latin word calva. But the Hebrew word is Golgotha. And they all mean the same thing, skull. This was a place that either the hill looked like a skull or it was just known for being the place where people died. And often the crucifixion bodies were, unless someone was going to take them, as we will see will happen uh, later on, the bodies were thrown in mass graves designed for these crucifixion victims. No one wanted them. And so there's likely all, it's probably a place of stench. It's a place of agony. And it's along a highway so that people passing by, again, can see. You, this is what happens when you revolt against Rome. And so they took him to Golgotha, and verse 34 says they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. This would have been almost acting as a narcotic. And I don't, listen, based on what we've seen so far, do you think the Romans really can, were concerned about alleviating pain as much as doping victims so they wouldn't fight them as they nailed them to the cross? This wasn't so much an act of mercy as much as something practical. In fact, the gall, someone suggests this was myrrh, and it was bitter. This was a bitter drink. But as soon as Jesus knew what it was, realized what it was, when he tasted of it, he would not drink. He would not take the narcotic. He would not dope himself up. No, he would feel all of this. He would allow all of this to be felt. He would experience all of this and go through it and... So they crucified him. They would take, they would have nails. And uh, Richard got, picked up some that were close, five to seven inches long for the hands. Now in those times, uh, they would consider, when they would say hand, they would also, they would mean not just the hand, the palm, but also down to the wrist. And so you say, well, it only makes sense that, you know, uh, we see things where they've got it through the wrists, and he says, look at my hands. Well, the, the hand, the palm, the, the nail would go right through that. It wouldn't support his weight. But the, they, typically the best way to do this, and if, if you like, I don't know about this, well, there is a, hold on a second. There is an article called On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ by William Edwards, M.D., okay? On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ, and I can tell you about this, in the Journal of the American Medical Association back in the 70s or 80s, and talked about it, he evaluated all the known evidence about crucifixion. And it was customary to do it through the wrist. And wh why is that? Because that would support the weight of the crucifixion victim. And they would hang there, and when they did that, there's a nerve right there. And that's a major nerve. And so as that spike would go through the victim's wrist, through the victim's hand in that sense, pain again, would fiery pain would course through their body. And here's more blood and here's more agony. And so they would, they would take the, the larger nail for the feet and they would nail them to the cross once they had the crossbars in place. And Jesus, you can just imagine, they typically drug up the crucifixion victim and throw him down. Well, Jesus didn't want that drug. But can you imagine, after all he's been through, can you imagine these rough men, these wicked men taking him, throwing him down and taking that nail? And driving it through his hands. And driving the nail through his feet. And they crucified him. Crucified him naked. He might have had some kind of a, an undergarment, a loincloth. But they took his clothes and they began to divide him up. And they gambled over his clothes. Matthew said, you see it in verse 35. It fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet. And we'll address that in a minute. And once they had raised him up, so I, I want to take your scene to imagine, use this cross in your mind's eye. They, they raised him up on the cross and they sat down. It was customary for, the, for Romans like this to sit and watch the criminals. And especially if someone was, was claimed to be some kind of a messianic figure, they wanted to make sure no followers tried to come. And, 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 and force some kind of rebellion and get their leader or, or something to that effect. So they'd sit down and they watched him there. And that, 
that's important, as we'll see in a minute. And they begin to watch him, and they set over his head that inscription, that accusation. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And so we're saying today, if you're taking notes, behold, the Gentiles mocked, scourged, and crucified the King of Israel. The Romans did this. They mocked, scourged, and crucified the king of Israel. And the the Gentiles, the Romans, they saw him as a fool. How do you see Jesus? How do you see him? We go on with the text. And as I mentioned, the highway, the crosses would be along the highway. And so there'd be people walking by. Passers-by, verse... uh, 39 would say, these that pass by and you have two thieves being crucified on on either side of Jesus and here comes people passing by and it was customary that as someone was nailed to a cross and people walked by, they would just hurl insults at them to curse the condemned because the Hebrew scripture said, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And so they would, it was just customary anyways, people would hurl these insults, but these people begin to revile Jesus and wag their heads, basically a, a great outward show of, of disapproval and shame against someone. They'd wag their heads and they begin to revile Jesus and said, hey, you're the one who said you could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Remember, this is the charge when he was in that private, illegal and unjust trial that they made against Jesus. He said he'll destroy the temple. He wasn't talking about the real temple. He was talking about how they would destroy his body and raise it again. And yet they took his words and twisted them and now it's um, spread to the public so that even the passers-by are saying, you said you could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And look what they said. They said, "If, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. You think you're the Son of God? If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And you can hear even the satanic whispers in this. Because can't you remember back in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan was tempting Jesus and three times he said, if thou be the Son of God, do this. And if thou be the Son of God, do this. And here he is being crucified, fulfilling the plan of God. And they are saying, if you're the Son of God, why don't you come down from the cross? If that's who you really are, rejecting all the evidence. If that's who you are, come down. And, and likewise, verse 41, the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. He healed others. He set others free from demonic oppression. He did all these things for others. He saved us. He can't save himself. If he's the king of Israel, if he's the Messiah, if he's the anointed one, if he's the chosen one, then let him come down the cross. Then we'll believe him as if their unbelief was his fault. Let him him show us who he is. He's been trying to show you who you are. And you won't believe. They refuse to believe that their Messiah was their Messiah. To them, he was a criminal. To them, they had to criminalize him. If they didn't criminalize Jesus, then they would have to own their own guilt. And their own sin. They had to curse Jesus or else they would feel the curse of their own sin in their life. And they just weren't ready to deal with who they really were on the inside. And not only that, you see, well, this is important. Look at verse 43. It says, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. He trusted God. Let let God deliver him now if he'll have him. Because he said, I'm the son of God. If he's the son of God, let God deliver him. Saying he trusted him. That's important. You'll see in a minute. And then even the thieves, and odds are these were Jewish men. Barabbas was likely a Jewish man who was supposed to be crucified, likely these robbers were caught in the same criminal act Barabbas was. They were obviously, the plan was obviously set for them to be crucified already. These were likely Jewish men as well and who picked up on what everyone else was saying and they started lobbing these things at Jesus too. The point is, every Jewish person there was mocking Jesus. Except for a few. All of these Jewish people, the passers-by and the religious leaders and, and these, even the thieves, even the criminals, all of them called Jesus a fake. All of them called him a criminal. All of them call the blasphemy. Are you seeing a trend here? So even though we're focusing on the scourging and we're focusing on the crucifixion, it's like Matthew is making a point that here were the Gentiles, here are the Romans, and this is what they had to say about Jesus. And here were the Jews, and this is what they had to say about Jesus. And they're crying against Jesus and saying, you're a fool, you're a moron, you're an idiot, you're pathetic. If you could save people, then save yourself. And yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what they had to say. 
And then we come, to, we come to God. What does he have to say? Because we see in, what, what verse is it? In verse 45, we see that from, so Jesus was on the cross. If we look at all the evidence, he was on the cross from 9 o'clock in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon or thereabouts. And from noon, the sixth hour, to three, the ninth hour, there was darkness. It was pitch black. And it wasn't even the season for, a, for an eclipse. Some people of the, in the ancient worldviews and all these things, they try to explain, oh, there's just some weird random eclipse. God turned the lights off. It went dark across the face of the whole world. And about that last hour, Jesus, he quotes from Psalm 22. And he cries out to God, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and what does he hear in return? Nothing. It's silent. Here's these people. Oh, king of Israel. Oh, worship the king. Hail. Here's these people. If you're the king of Israel, come down from the cross. And here's Jesus saying, God, why have you forsaken me? And no answer. If he was his son, why did this happen? And as, he's, as he said that, the people, they thought he... They heard Eli, Eli, and the Hebrew was similar to the name of Elijah. And so they're like, well, he's calling for Elijah. And there's some weird tradition about that. People believe in that if someone, because who remembers how Elijah was taken to heaven in a fiery chair and he didn't actually die? There were some traditions that people would call to Elijah to help rescue them from death or something like that, something hokey like that. And so maybe they thought, maybe they misheard him and they, they said, well, uh, Elijah, he's calling to Elijah. And, and, and so someone went and they tried to give him a drink, give him some vinegar uh, to drink uh, on a sponge. And then the rest said, hey, leave him alone and, and still mocking him. Let's see whether Elijah will save him. And then Jesus, he cried with a loud voice again and he gave up the ghost as a friend of mine would say it was not something they took it was something he gave only Jesus had the power when his life would be taken and his life was not taken at scourging even when he had been hanging on the cross and, and trying to breathe being fixed in a place where it, the way the cross the crucifixion victims would be fixed would put them in a place where it was just constant constant inhaling <gasps> That's all they could do. And the only way they could exhale was to pull themselves up, scratch their back on that thing, and, 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 and exhale on the way up. And then they'd have to let themselves back down. And that's the only way they could breathe. That's the only way Jesus said those seven last cries from the cross you find across the Gospels. And even after all of that, he, that did not take his life. He yielded up the ghost. He would die when it was his time. And he was in control of that over, until the very end. And as soon as he died, and I won't give so much commentary on this. But as soon as he died in the temple, these partitions, the, the veil of the temple between the Holy of Holies, where they would make the sacrifices, where it was believed the presence of God was, the partition between that place and the holies and the other courts, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. And in fact, at the site, there was an earthquake in that city on that day. And the rocks were ripped open. And in fact, after his resurrection, and we're going to see what this is all about. God's trying to talk without talking. And, and the graves were open and bodies of the saints. And they came out after his resurrection, it says, and appeared to many. And the, but the but point is, we get up to number four. When the centurion, they were watching all that happen. They watched Jesus get scourged and suffer. And they watched him suffer all the spit. And they watched him be crucified. And they watched him hang in there. And they watched the earthquake. Here were Romans who were a part of all of this. Who might have even said, oh, hell, king of Israel. But when they saw all of this... Remember, they were sitting there watching it. Are you with me this morning? They, when they saw all of it, you know what they said? Truly, this was the Son of God. They could not deny what was plain to be seen. They could not deny it, and they confessed it. And it was obvious. So that leaves us with a question, and that's where we need to go to the Old Testament, okay? Psalm 22. If he was the Son of God like the Romans... The centurion willingly said, then why did the Christ, the Son of God, suffer and die? 
Why did the Christ, the Son of God, suffer and die? Psalm 22. Now, you've got to realize, and you're doing a wonderful job today, and I appreciate your attention. It's important that you get this deep in your soul. Because Psalm 22 and Psalm 69 were written by Jesus' great, 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 grandfather, over a thousand years removed by the name of King David, he wrote these words. Now, I want you to look at Psalm 22 and see, and you can fill in the blank, that unwittingly, without realizing it, the Gentiles fulfilled ancient prophecy by their words and actions. So when the Gentiles were doing all this to Jesus, and doing all this to Jesus, and even offering Him that drink, they were fulfilling ancient prophecy written a thousand years before this happened. Look at verse 11 of Psalm 22. The psalmist cried, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Remember, the psalmist is praying. He's talking to God. God's the one. He's saying, you brought me to this point. God was the one who allowed his son to get to, the point, to this point. Verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Watch this. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They, what? Part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. This was written over a thousand years before this stuff ever happened. And Matthew made sure we know, knew about that. Hold your place in Psalm 22. Go to Psalm chapter 69. Psalm chapter 69. And look at verse 20. Again, a psalm of David. And David said this, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforter, comforters, but I found none. Did Jesus find any comforters there at that scene? Not even from his own father. Verse 21, they gave me also gall for my meat. Does that sound familiar? And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Again, a thousand years written before Jesus experienced these things. Go back to Psalm chapter 22. So unwittingly the Gentiles fulfilled ancient prophecy by their words and actions. And you see also that unwittingly the Jews fulfilled ancient prophecy by their words and actions. Look at verse 6 of Psalm 22. The psalmist said, I'm a worm and no man. A reproach of men and despised of the people. And all they that see me, what do they do? They laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They just say stuff. They shake the head. Wait a minute. People that were walking by, what were they doing? They were wagging their head and saying these things. And verse 8, what did they say? In, in this psalm, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Does that sound familiar? A thousand years before it ever happened, God said how it would happen. So what does that tell you about Jesus? If God spoke on this hundreds and hundreds of years before, yea, a thousand years before, then who was Jesus? Was Jesus just a fool? Was Jesus just a criminal? No, Jesus was not a fool. And Jesus was not a criminal. Jesus was and is the Christ. The Son of the living God. And God had been speaking about Him for generations. That's who He was. That's who He is. And according to the Scriptures, then why did He die? Go to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Go on actually to chapter 52. Chapter 50 and verse 6. Isaiah prophesied some six, seven hundred years before Jesus said this, I gave my back to the smiters. 
my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Six to seven hundred years before this happened, the prophet said, I let the smiters have my back and I let them have my beard and I let them just spit on me and give me shame. And then you look at chapter 52, look at verse 13. This is God's commentary on his servant, the Messiah. And this is what he said about him. My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. In other words, my servant, my Messiah will be successful in his mission and he's going to be exalted and very high. And how would that happen? It would happen in how shockingly he died. Look at verse 14. As many as were astonished or astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man. What does that mean? He was so disfigured, you couldn't even recognize him as a man. His form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. What Sprinkle them with what? Keep, follow, follow the words of the... These are the words of God. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. Pilate could not believe Jesus responded the way that he did. For that which had not been told them shall they see. Pilate had never heard the Messianic scriptures, but right before his eyes he saw these very things happen. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. And then the prophet says this. Follow what he says. Very, this is so important. You see what God has to say. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, talking about his servant, the Messiah shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and we shall see, when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. When someone would look at Jesus, there was no natural beauty that they would see and say, yeah, that looks like a great Messiah. That looks like a great king, a great hero. No, in fact, verse 3, follow, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. This is a, the, a Jewish commentary. This is what God's saying the Jews would say. We hid our faces from him. We were ashamed of him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. The Jews, as they mocked him, they didn't esteem him. They didn't see him as worth anything. They didn't see him as their king. But the prophet prophesies here that one day they're going to look back and realize something. Look at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. We thought God was punishing a man who was a blasphemer. Isaiah wrote this six to seven hundred years before the Jews thought all this about Jesus. We thought he was smitten of God and afflicted, but why was he killed? Verse 5, follow. He was wounded for our transgressions. Our crimes against God. Our disobedience of God's word. Our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. In other words, the punishment that we deserve. That made us, at, uh, that discord with God. He was punished so we could have peace with God. With his stripes, his bruises, his lashes, his open, oozing, bleeding flesh by his stripes. We are healed. And why do we need healing? Why did we deserve this? Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all wandered away like a foolish sheep. We've turned everyone to his own way doing whatever we want to do, whatever we, we feel like doing, even if it violates God and violates fellow man. And watch this. The Lord God hath laid on him, the suffering servant, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as the sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? In other words, he's not going to have a fair trial. 
No prison sentence, no right due trial, no one to defend him who's going to declare his generation. Again, six to seven hundred years before this was written, uh, before this happened, he was cut off out of the land of the living. Why? 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 For the transgression of my people was he stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked. He was crucified with wicked thieves who were condemning him, and with the rich in his death. Why did why did he die? He because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Why did the Son of God, if he is a Christ, why did this happen? Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased God to let this happen to his son. He hath put him to grief, verse 10 says. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. You see, God delivered up his son into the hands of wicked men to suffer and die. So his soul would be an offering for sin. What am I saying? God killed his son in your place and my place. Jesus was not, is not the fool. I am. And you are. Jesus was not, is not the criminal. I am. And you are. And all of this that happened to Jesus, because of your sin and the eyes of the holy God, you deserve for this to happen to you. No, I'm a good person. Okay, so you think you're religious. Then join the chief priests and the elders who want to deny the truth that Jesus said about them. And then go ahead and kill the righteous son of God. Because you don't need him. If you're good enough, you don't need what he did. But you're the fool, and you're the criminal, and I'm the fool, and I'm the criminal, and he's the son of God, and he literally took your place. And at Passover season, when they would slay the, kill those lambs and offer them up to cover their sins, God offered his son and your place. And there's nothing left for you to do but to repent, to turn from your sin, to turn from your efforts to save yourself or make yourself better and cast yourself at the feet of Jesus and cry out to Jesus, you are the king, you are Lord, and I believe that you died for me. And he didn't stay dead, he rose again, but you'll have to come back to hear those texts. He rose again. And if you want, if you want this to be personal to you, it's more than just, well, yeah, he died for me, and now I'm just going to try to earn my way to heaven. That's, that's religion, friend. You're not good enough. And that's why he died. And I'm not good enough, and that's why he died. And he calls you to repent and simply, humbly believe the gospel. That's it. Call on the name of the Lord, and he will save you just like that. But who do you say Jesus is? Now, Christian... I need to ask you a question. Because if God let all of this happen for, for your sin, what does God think about your sin? It's covered, yes. God's holy perspective of your sin, He hates your sin. And you deserve justice for your sin. And the cross shows us two things. It reveals how much God hates our sin. And yet how much God loves the sinner. And not just me and not just you, but the whole world. Paul would say he gave his life as a ransom for all. For everybody. For all people. He loves everybody. God loves people. So Christian, if you have repented and believed the gospel, how can you love what God hates? If Christ died for your anger and your pride and your lust your selfishness and your deceit. How can you love what God hates? And how can you hate and resent who God loves? Because if God is willing to do this to prove his love to everybody, then there's not a day goes by that he ceases to love me. And if that's true of me, and I'm called to let the cross guide my life, then that means I am called to hate my sin and my selfishness every day. As a Christian, this is impossible to do if you're not saved. It's impossible. 
<laughs> you're like, I, 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 I can't do that. Exactly. That's why Jesus died and rose again. But if you're a Christian, the power of God, the Spirit of God is in you. So you learn to hate your sin and to love God and love people exactly the same way God loved you. Behold your crucified king. Don't leave here today unchanged by the gospel of Jesus Christ.